So I'm not, don't think that's for, for, for Ben or me. I think that's directed towards uh, Mr. Turner. I'm sorry you feel like that, Rodrigo, but feel free to take that comment and stick it up your ass, old boy. <laughs> you, know, you know, it just goes to show that people will find a reason to complain about anything. <laughs> you, you, you goddamn right. All right, everybody. So that will leave it for NFA Live. So everybody, there's much more to talk about today and complain about than Guy's British accent. Welcome. Welcome to Friday live stream here, Digital Asset News. Thanks for stopping by. We've got a ton of stuff to go over, so let's just jump right into it. First off, Jim Bianco. If you don't follow, if you don't follow Jim Bianco, he is great. He really breaks things down in a macro sense. He takes a look at traditional markets, take a look at crypto markets. Really smart guy. I like what he puts out. Link in the description, you can check it out. And what he was talking about a couple of days ago, he was on uh, Natalie Brunel's channel. And this was actually sent to me by a subscriber. Thank you guys so much. And it's a very good nuanced conversation. It's about 49 minutes long, but there is a minute and a half piece I want to share with you about what he talks about as far as, and this is why I named the thumbnail on the title, uh, which is traditional FI or trad FI trickery and what's going on. Because there's been this consensus that's been going on like, Rob, there's so many, there's, as far as this, this ETF flow, there's been so much. Why hasn't the Bitcoin price uh, really jumped up? Well, first of all, it has. Now, as a reminder, I think we've tripled in uh, since the beginning of, the, of this year, as far as the Bitcoin price. I want to say it was somewhere around 27, 28, correct me in the comment section, jumped it all the way to 73K, and now has settled around 63K or whatever it is today. I don't really check too much. But uh, we can see that over time, as far as the ETF, we can see that uh, there were some big jumps in the beginning from uh, roughly February. This is when it had uh, 62,000 Bitcoin uh, circulating around for this ETF. And then within a very short amount of time in uh, March, we had 201,000. The next big jump actually came from the uh, beginning of March at around 160K and jumped all the way up to 260K uh, at, uh, Bitcoins in these ETFs. And that was uh, in June. And now we're kind of struggling here, not struggling, but kind of going sideways. I think we topped out at 304,000 Bitcoin and now we're at 295,000. So looking pretty good, a heck of a lot better than of course the Ethereum ETF. Here's the flow. And you can see because of uh, Grayscale, you know, they've just been uh, uh, outflowing quite a bit and the net flows are negative 610 million. Now we can see over here, it's been positive the whole time, but that is just par for the course. So the question is why? Why, when we have such an inflow, what the heck is going on here? So this is a minute and a half. And just take a listen to this. This starts about 25 minutes. So I want you to take a listen and kind of understand where things are going. Now, this is all on-chain data. So take a let me make sure you can actually hear this the correct way. Let me put on the tab. All right. Take a listen. Has there been no net new money into the ECTFs? And there's been $17 billion of net money into the Bitcoin ETFs. Let me break that down. 12 of that 17 billion came in by March. And 4 billion has come in over the last four months. 1 billion has come in over the last three months. And 1 billion has outflowed over the last month. So those outflows, those flows have been, been, been slowing. And the answer that I, I, I've, I've looked at with the data is that you know a lot of the flows that you see in the other the non grayscale ETF because grayscale has been getting nothing but outflows right a lot of that money is going to the BlackRock ETF the Fidelity ETF the Bitwise ETF and they're getting a lot of money from there if you look at a lot of the on chain analysis where is most of the money coming from that's going into these funds most of the money and it's really coming from on chain and if you want me to put it bluntly, it's somebody that owns Bitcoin in a Coinbase account. Oh, now I can buy the BlackRock ETF. So they sell their Bitcoin in their Coinbase account. They move it back to their E-Trade or, they, or their Robinhood account, and they buy IBIT. Well, that's not net new money into the space. It just moved from on-chain back into their TradFi account. That's the vast majority of the money. When you cut through it all, that $17 billion dollars. How much of that money, when you talk about is move from, move from grayscale, move from on-chain into off-chain, how much of that money is actually new money? And I only think it's a couple of billion dollars. So 
crazy right there, right? And we've been listening to this and talking about this. We're like, oh, it's, you know, this, there's so much going on. And then there's a supply shock and the supply shock's going to happen. And it's really going to take off. And you take a look at this and you, and you hear it and you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, how bad can it get? And that's when we have to zoom out and just remember that we did a marvelous run in a very short amount of time. So as people are moving things around, I get it. And now, I mean, we can, and of course, I linked this entire conversation in the description and it's, it's great. There's great alpha being spewed here. I shouldn't say it like that, but really great information that's being put out and uh, great questions from, from Natalie. And then when he, and then when Jim starts to talk more so about what's going on as far as traditional finance, he says what we've been talking about this channel before, which is like when traditional finance gets in, you have to understand they have their trickery. They have their, the things that traditional finance do which is they play both sides of the market. They'll short, they'll long, they'll use bots, they'll have trades, they'll do all these things that can really move and manipulate the price. And then uh, watch this video because it's not all negative. Actually, Jim is extremely bullish on 2025 and he thinks that going into 2028 is gonna be even bigger. So take a listen to that. It's not all negative, but as a reminder, if we take a look at total liquidation charts, we can see that over the last, what, since March, uh, like in six months ago. I mean, there's just in, let's just take like this one day, the 4th of August, not too long ago, it was over a billion dollars worth of shorts and longs getting wrecked. And there's been billions upon billions of dollars flowing in and out. And where do you think that comes from? It comes from these traditional finance folks who are getting into that. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying that's the nature of the beast. And then as a reminder, if you're thinking to yourself, well, why doesn't it just keep going up? Because, you know, there's so much things going on. We just talked about that. But also remember, there's a lot of things going on in the background. There's margin trading. There's leverage being happening. I mean, it's not just, you know, you're just doing spot. You could be doing 10, 25, 50X, you know, a bunch of degens. People get liquidated, we just talked about. Then the price moves down. We have a herd mentality. Thin order books, bot trading, which I think is going on a whole heck of a lot. Slippage, arbitrage, and stop, stop loss orders. So when we take a look and bring this all together, we can understand that we're in a different environment right now. It's gonna take some time. I still believe we've got a way to go. I think things will start to really pop off around November, going into December in 2025. We just have to get to this uh, presidential election and we'll see where we go. So just giving you some insight. Let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And speaking of elections and governments, Nick Carter. This was a great piece and I linked the entire thing down in the description because again, there's a lot of things that are going on. I try to bring you the best information I possibly can and bring you balance because if I just give you moon boy stuff, you'll only think that we're going to keep going up and that's not how it works. So Nick has been a big uh, advocate or proponent of, and description of Operation Choke Point 2.0. And what he says here really brings it home. And why I'm sending this to you or talking about this again is because people believe that government is irrelevant and Bitcoin and crypto do not need governments and it's inevitable. And you're right, it's true. But I will tell you this, it can slow down the whole process a whole heck of a lot. And this is proof. So Nick talks about, hey, Operation 2.0, here's some examples and why things are different. He says the first casualty was Silvergate Bank. Remember that bank that, that uh, dropped off the face of the planet? And then, of course, there was some high-ranking members like Crypto Karen, Elizabeth Warren, talked about how they should essentially do a run of the bank. That Silvergate Bank. The common reporting in, uh, around Silvergate was that they lent to crypto depositors. Those depositors were flighty. When rates rose, they suffered M2 losses on bond portfolios. And I'm insolvent, except that's not true. They weren't insolvent. Silvergate weathered the storm, even though short sellers and members of Congress like Crypto Karen encouraged a bank run based on rumors that Silvergate had criminal exposure to FTX. Why would she say that? It's because she's building an anti-crypto army. She's partially responsible for this. They suffered huge redemptions after FTX, but were still solvent, which is pretty amazing, and were able to do business. Imagine that. An American business is doing what it's supposed to do, weathers the storm, gets out because it's a free market, and gets screwed over by Congress. That's what happened. And uh, to continue, get off my soapbox, and there was one problem. The Fed told them that they had to reduce their crypto exposure to only a nominal 
or ancillary part of the business. This is like telling Dunkin' Donuts that they can't sell donuts. <laughs> Silvergate was a boutique crypto bank that served the crypto industry. So after the Fed came with this new informal guidance, their business ceased to exist. That is, that is what it is. The bank's assets were also toxic as it became clear with Silver, Silvergate B and Silvergate that they, any crypto related lines of business would not be eligible to be sold according to the OCC. I broke the story here. One point I've endeavored to make is that Silvergate died by murder, not by suicide. In my original reporting, I thought this was the FDIC, but it was actually the S San Francisco Fed. The reason why I'm writing this thread, new developments. We haven't had any actual evidence of the scandal at Silvergate beyond statements made by bank executives. What's new is Elaine Hetrick, the former chief administrative officer of Silvergate, filed a declaration as part of Silvergate's Chapter 11 filings. It's completely and totally collaborates what I wrote in my reporting, and it's totally on the record. I'm going to have you do your own research and go into this piece. But what it essentially is saying is this. The things that Nick was talking about with what he was illuminating to actually became true and were actually happening behind the scenes. You can take a look at that. I will uh, have you go there. There's a link in the description. You can check it out and you can see what's actually happening. So with that piece, I will just say that again, yes, we don't need the government. Crypto, Bitcoin, digital assets are bigger than the government. But like I said, they can sure throw a wrench into the whole operation and slow things down to a crawl. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that. And then also down to a crawl, let's talk about Ethereum. This was, uh, actually, let's talk about Ben and Ethereum. So Ben has uh, been a big instigator of the Bitcoin Ethereum pairs. So, as, so far, he's been pretty right on some Bitcoin dominance things. Good for him. Anyhow, and this is, uh, <laughs> he says, the reason I can't call this despite going, uh, the Ethereum Bitcoin pair is going uh, less than 0.04 is because after ETH and Bitcoin broke down, because the pairs are actually breaking down, in 2016, 2019, ETH USD then dropped 70%. And Ben's been a big, a big instigator that's saying that we're going to see lower bleeding of Ethereum against Bitcoin. And he compares it to 2019. And in Q4, the ETH Bitcoin bricks broke down in 2019, a Q4. Helping this make sense, but the APOL has to, be, has to be reserved for special circumstances. And he says it here, the last two times that ETH Bitcoin broke down, approximately 70%. And he's essentially saying that this would be uh, Q4 of 2019. So it got me to thinking. What does that look like with risk levels? Now we talked a lot about risk levels and this is some of the data that I, I base my buying and selling strategy. There's a link in the description where I talk about when I'm gonna sell 80% of my crypto, check that out if you want to. But I thought to myself, what are the risk levels right now today for Ethereum? Oh, look at that, it's right there. It's at 0 0.52. And just so you know, if you're talking about risk levels and these, these will fluctuate, little by little. But if we go to 0 0.975 and, and 1.0 or perfection, this is a, some may say this is a price prediction, but take it as you may. 11,728 would be the high point. The low point for Ethereum, because right now we're at around 2,500, 0 0.52, so right in the middle. The low point would be 460 bucks. Woo, that'd be great if it actually happened. But what did that look like Back in Q4, Ben was talking about this actually breaking down. This is uh, historical risk levels. You can take a look. There's a link in the description. You can check out Ben's website. Some parts are free, some parts are paid. But what we have here, let's just break this down into Ethereum. Take a look at 2019. Well, okay. This is 2018. The risk level is 0, 0.0. I think Ethereum was below $400 at that point. I think it was like 100 bucks. Correct me in the comments section. But if we go to Q4 of 2019, let's just zoom in here to all this. So Q4, October, November, December, here's September, October. The ETH risk levels, 0 0.45. Let's go further. I think it goes lower than that. 
24th of November, 0.413. I think it was lower than that, actually. In December of 2019, wow. The risk level to zero, went to 0 0.37 in 2019. So what would that price frame look like if it does break down again? Well, if we take a look here to 0 0.37, yeah. we're looking at a price level of $1,551. Does that mean it's absolutely going to happen? No, but I want you to be mentally prepared. If you're at 2,500, could you weather the storm and you own Ethereum, like I do, to go down to 1,500? What would you do in that situation? Would you be selling? Would you be buying a little bit? Would you be buying the same amount or would you be buying more? Let me know what you, what you would do in the comment section. And if you would like to learn more about dynamic DCAing, there's also a link in the description. That's part of my four videos I always talk about as far as things to watch. So take a look. Anyhow, let me just think about that. And then lastly, before I get into this, this, this last piece, when we get into a little Q&A, I just want to remind everybody, balance, right? Balance. That's all I'm trying to do here. I'm not here to pick winners because I'm very bad at that. I'm here to talk about what's going on in the crypto and digital asset space. So if I talk about something that you don't own, that's okay. And the next thing I'm gonna talk about is Solana. I know a lot of people either love it or hate it. There's not too many people in the middle. Like, it's kind of funny. But just as a reminder, I was actually at Rare Evo event in Las Vegas just roughly about three, four weeks ago, which was primarily a Cardano event. So don't flip out in the comment section when I talk about things that are going on with Solana. Just saying. This is from Gumshoe. And uh, he says, insane day at Solana Breakpoint going on. I guess it's uh, wrapping up. Maybe it goes on one more day. He said, this is everything that happened on day one. So pretty cool. Uh, first thing on Solana, Franklin Templeton was announced. One of those big, massive mutual fund organization institutions that's been around forever. Franklin Templeton plans to launch a mutual fund on the blockchain. It looks like they're going to pick Solana. They manage assets worth $1.3 trillion. That's good news if you're Solana. Maybe what else they pick and make that mutual fund. Second part, Fire Dancer. Kevin Bowers from Jump announced that Fire Dancer is now live on Testnet. And Franken Dancer? That's funny. Is live on Mainnet. Fire Dancer goes live on Mainnet. will officially remove Solana from beta. Oh, I didn't know that. So now when everybody was talking about it's in beta, it's in beta, and beta. Okay, but if it goes down, it's not in beta. Just saying. What the first of all, what, what the heck is Fire Dancer? This was a great article from Kraken. I linked the description as well. What is Fire Dancer? Why is it big? Fire Dancer is a new third-party validator client. All right, what is that? So clients or client software, they run this on their computer. Individuals are referred to as nodes. Nodes secure and maintain blockchain networks. Great. So what does that mean? So products like Ethereum encourage external developers to create their own client implementations in various programming languages. There are several different options node operators have when deciding which client they'd like to use. That's why people talk about Ethereum being roughly pretty much decentralized, right? Not as decentralized as Bitcoin. You got me on that one. Gotcha. Okay. But Solana, not so much. Well, they're going to change that. So Solana blockchain has only three validator clients. Solana Labs client, written in Rust, programming language. Jito Solana client, forked from a Solana Labs client, also written in Rust, programming language. Sig client, written Zig, programming language. Okay, boring. Solana is not as resilient to attacks as its main competitor, which is Ethereum, which currently boasts Ethereum around six different consensus clients and eight execution clients. So why is Fidancer so important? Well. It rep represents a new high-performance validator client. Great. Got one more written in C++ programming language. Awesome. So not in Rust and whatever the heck Zig programming language is. And just so you know, in 2022, this is where it gets kind of exciting. Fire Dancer demonstrated an ability to process over 1 million transactions per second. 1 million. This figure is many times greater than Solana's current theoretical limit of 50,000 TPS. So there is two big pieces, right? Like Gumshoe just talked about. Franklin Templeton, and now Fire Dancer is on testnet. Hope it goes great. Because I own it, and I'd like it to do well. I also own a bunch of other stuff like BNB, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, 
chain link, ton, you name it. I own a lot of it. I'm biased. Shoot me. Also, uh, this is from DGen News, Jupiter Exchange Mobile. This is interesting. Jupiter Exchange to allow Apple Pay, which if you don't know what Jupiter Exchange is, essentially it's a decentralized exchange based on, based on Solana. And they're gonna allow Apple Pay, Google Pay, credit card on ramping. Now, some people look at this and go, that's awesome. I look at this and go, that sucks. And I'm gonna tell you why it sucks. It's because if you've ever used MoonPay or anything like that, which is like using credit cards or debit cards, especially in Ledger, you know how high the transactional costs are. So this is gonna be like, oh, you can use Apple Pay or Google Pay, but you gotta pay 12.7% transaction charge. No one's gonna use that. Okay, that was a little ridiculous. Let's, anything above 3%, I think would be kind of ridiculous because that's usually what people pay if you're using like debit and credit cards for the manufacturers. So, I mean, that's great. I like it, but we'll see what the transactional costs are. I could be wrong. Maybe it's 0.0002%. I have no idea, but I think that's, I mean, it's good, but I look at that, I'm always very skeptical and that's just me. And then also, um, there's a new phone coming out on Solana. It's called Seeker. And they've already got 200,000 pre-orders, which if you don't remember, like the original Solana phone did so well because it was preloaded with a bunch of different uh, Solana ecosystem uh, tokens, such as like Bonk, and then you could redeem it. And the price of the phone was actually, you actually made money in that situation. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be this way again, but it looks like there's a new phone coming out. I'm amazed that they can actually do this. They got a seed vault. Uh, I don't really know what it does, but it looks cool. And then also this is the thing, whether Seeker is your daily driver or Web3 device at home, it can earn you with D-pin apps like Helium, which will be offering four months of free coverage. Now just so you know, uh, Helium Mobile actually works and it's a pretty decent plan from what I understand. It's like 20 bucks a month, unlimited talk, text, and data. It's not available everywhere, but I'm like, that's pretty good. You get four months of free service. Excellent. That's how you get people. And like I said, and I said, look, if Solana is doing this and they're doing their job, right? And their job is to get partnerships. Their job is to grow and their job is to improve. And in that situation, they're doing what they're supposed to do as a business moving forward, the Solana Foundation, now the token, eh, whatever. But again, I own it, I'm biased. I also own a bunch of other stuff, so shoot me. And that, that's it for that. And then lastly, I thought this was interesting, but I mean, let's see how it works. There's a, also they're doing gaming. It's called Play Solana. And uh, this is their first handheld device. I gotta tell you, it looks like a Game Boy, but maybe it does cool stuff, I'm not for sure. Uh, but this is all I have. It's like a little teaser trailer. So, uh, you know, interesting. Maybe this will be like also like this original Solana phone. Like you get this and it's like preloaded with like uh, Web3 games with Web3 tokens or NFT. I don't know. But uh, again, pretty impressive that they're doing all these things together. So that's what's going on. Again, as a reminder, I cover a lot of, a lot of cryptos and tokens. Don't shoot me just because I talked about Solana for six minutes. And that's it for today. So look. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. Now, if you want to go over a little Q&A, we'll, I'll answer all your questions to the best of my abilities, and then we'll get out of here and enjoy the rest of our weekend.